All right, everyone. Welcome to today's class all about um, insurance, how insurance works, the different dynamics of, you know, what, why the deadlines are in the contract, what they mean, what you can do, the ins and outs. Um, and also, we're going to have um, Sean Browning with American National Insurance come on here in about next 15 minutes or so. And he's got a, a PowerPoint for us, talk about his company a little bit, talk about some of the things that he's seen um, in the insurance world of going through a real estate transaction. Um, so I hope I don't steal too much of his thunder, but let's just open up with a little bit of our CREC docs um, kind of stuff that deals with insurance. Um, so let, let's break this down. So obviously you can't really grab a quote for insurance before you start looking at homes. The quotes for insurance are house specific. So step number one is your buyers don't need to have, uh, you know, an insurance company lined up before you go see houses. Okay, that is a, it's not a common question, but the buyers do ask it every now and then. They want to get their homeowner's insurance ready. They want to get their lending ready. Um, if you guys know anything about the disc profile, if you get that high C, that's about the time that I see them ask all of those different questions. So step number one is you can't grab a quote on something that doesn't have an address. Um, a lot of people think that insurance is going to be based upon kind of what you want to have covered. So if you were looking at a $500,000 house, they, some people think that you can just go talk to an insurance company and say, I'd like to have a, a, a $500,000 homeowner's policy, please. What would that cost me? And the reality is, is it's based upon age. It's based, there's so many things it's based upon. Um, obviously, location, acreage, buildings, you, you name it. It's not always just about the value per se of what the buyer is going to be spending. So you go under contract and in the contract, there's a date and deadline for a uh, property insurance deadline. So the next piece that you need to know is it's a deadline for the buyer to grab an, uh, an adequate quote to them. So you go under contract and now you have purchase price, you have an address that the insurance company can look up and then you can walk through exactly what kind of coverage you want. I'm not going to get too far into the weeds of, uh, as far as coverage goes, but really what I want you guys to know is that you should be having vendors or um, insurance vendors on your list that that you just naturally see ask a lot of questions right so if anybody in here has ever dealt with homeowners insurance you have some insurance reps that will basically you'll tell you'll tell them hey look here's the house here's what i want here's here's this but you don't really know what you want and they just they just give you a quote and they say does this look great and does this look adequate if you don't know insurance I don't know how anybody reads through it all in its entirety and understands it to its full severity. And what I mean by that is, is insurance companies, they get paid on the premium. So um, most insurance companies will pay out their insurance agents about 80% of the premium in some cases. So on a $1,400 or a $1,400 po year policy, you know, they're making about a grand off of that. So it's in their best interest to quote you at something that looks like it's going to beat everybody else. The problem with that is, is you get what you pay for. And so you want to make sure that, that you have insurance reps that are truthful, honest, and aren't just looking to make that buck and can articulate. See, here's the biggest thing. This is why we do scripts. This is why we role play. We do scripts and role play because we're, we are professional agents. We need to know how to talk around commission objections. We need to know how to talk around what a CMA is. And, and same thing in the insurance world. You need an insurance vendor who can articulate exactly what it is, their products that they have that they sell, and what may or may not be right for the other, um, uh, for, the, for the borrower. And, and I'm obviously insurance, we're going to be mainly talking about buyers uh, today. But you guys, what I'm getting at is, is you could have a great insurance rep that takes care of your clients, does everything under the sun, but the only thing that they don't do is they don't know how to show their own value. And so you have some buyers that will go out and get a quote for the house that they just went under contract on. And it, let's say it's $1,000 a, a year, so 100 bucks a month. And then your insurance vendor says, yeah, here's your quote for $1,500 a year. And if your insurance person can't talk around why that extra $500,000 is, or $500 is that important, the other guy gets the business and then a house fire happens and the house is underinsured or doesn't even, call, doesn't, you know, doesn't even cover 80% of that cost. 
there's a reason why typically those there's such a big price swing. Now, some people have just better rates for the same exact comparison. But that's also what I want to talk to you guys about is the comparison. Make sure you have an insurance rep who knows how to read through other quotes. So that way you can kind of stack them up. So that way they can show your clients the differences between that. Um, uh, for instance, I talked to an insurance guy. I had, um, you know, I got, I had no idea what I didn't know. Um, I wanted to find the cheapest rate because I just felt like my house, I just needed homeowner's insurance. Common folk, I, I was an agent still at this time, you guys. I just wanted homeowner's insurance. I didn't know that, I thought that they just give you like if your house, if you pay $500,000 for your house and it burns down, they'll build your house for 500000 I had no clue and concept of how that all worked. And, and what I mean by that is I talked to one guy. I got a great quote. I took it, went under contract, got to closing. It's the first house. Um, it's, it's actually the house that I always use for CMAs. Um, and I went to an insurance class. And bam, there were so many questions and so many things that I learned. So hopefully when Sean gets on here, um, he's got plenty of food for thoughts for you guys. Because after going to that insurance class, I thought, wow, I was not faced or ready with enough questions. And I, and I can almost personally guarantee that half of your buyers won't be as well. So I believe that it's just like a, just like a lender referral and lender relationship, an inspection referral and inspection relationship. Um, insurance relationships are absolutely strong as well. Um, we are actually working on bringing an in-house insurance company in. So that way we can do more classes like this. Sean, I'm bringing in because he's a longtime friend and he's got some different nuances um, with his company. When, uh, when I, when I uh, had my quote out with Sean, we really broke it down because it was, it was slightly higher than where I'm at right now. But the value that that, that company brings is, is unreal. I've never seen an insurance company have some of these products that he has built in. So I'm excited to bring him on today. Um, you know, a lot of time, a lot of time, new build, new build companies will work with an insurance company to give a really good rate, right? So it's almost like that first year rate. And I had two buyers, two home buyers last year that bought new homes, and I said to both of them, "When when your first year is up, I guarantee you this this is going to go up, um, and then you're going to need to do your homework." before that so that you can get the right kind of insurance that you want. Lo and behold, I had one call me last month and say, wow, Harry, you were right. My insurance went way up. And it's because they got that introductory offer. They hope yep. to be able to keep you because it's such a pain to go find insurance that you'll pay that higher premium, which is where they were going to be in the first place, right? It's that introductory offer kind of thing. Yep. So I always just tell new build people when they tell me that, say, okay, that's fantastic. I'm glad you're going to get that insurance. But do me a big favor. And when you get close to next year, you start researching out to find another company because I think you'll find that this is going to go up. Anyway. Yep. So uh, before Sean gets started here, um, in the contracts, there's a date and deadline. That date and deadline is to have your borrower grab an adequate homeowner's insurance quote. Um, but it, it's a quote, right? You can't have owner, homeowner's insurance on a property in place for a property you don't yet own. And so I think Sean might talk through the nuances of how that works. It's, it's just a quote. And then he does what he does with the lender, the title company, and all of those things to make sure that that policy is, is, is fully enforced and in place at the day of close. Um, Mr. Sean Browning, that was perfect timing. That was like my last little nuance for, uh, for what we do in our contracts. But just to reiterate, because I, I said it fast, there's a date and deadline in the contract for homeowner's insurance. It's a homeowner's insurance termination deadline. And that deadline is the deadline for your borrower to call someone like Sean to grab a quote and go through those nuances to make sure that this is one, the house that you want to buy um, and, and the quote's adequate for what you want to be covered. So anyways, with further, without further ado, Mr. Sean Browning from American National Insurance. Man, I appreciate you being on here. We, um, we haven't had a we haven't had anybody on our Wednesday training in a long time. So um, welcome, my friend. And I made you host, so thank if you've you. got a presentation, go ahead. Thank, thank you for having me. Yeah, you bet, man. Um, you know, my goal is to provide as much value as I can on the insurance side, um, help, help make your guys' lives easier, help bring to your attention some things that you want to consider for your clients. Um, you know, I have a number of different tools um, in the real estate toolbox, so to speak, that I'm going to share with you guys today. 
um, and review. One of those is um, a pre-closing checklist and a post-closing checklist. Um, very simple. Uh, it's like two or three points that help you evaluate and, and allow your client to provide them with the education um, on knowing what to check after they close. Um, you know, closing on insurance these days, you know, yes, yes, rates are low and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, rates are low, you know, yes, we're in a com competitive environment. Pe people want to buy houses. A lot of people that want to buy houses, obviously not enough houses, um, uh, inventory is an issue. Um, but also money is still an issue, I think, for a lot of buyers and lenders really want to get the deal closed. Real estate agents want to get the deal closed. The buyer wants to get the deal closed, but the policy that gets the deal to close may not be the policy that you want it to be long-term. And I have people, I've heard stories of people having to foreclose on homes because, you know, they can't repair the damage because their deductible was $20,000, you know, or um, they realized that they didn't have roof coverage. Um, I mean, these types of things are, are inexcusable typically in this type of industry and in this type of environment. Um, these are the, the small little things that fall through the, through, through the gap. So whoever you're referring your business to, whoever, whatever you're doing, recommend to your, your client to follow up with their insurance agent, follow up with their company and get a review completed um, after closing. Very, very important. So just want to touch on that real quick. <laughs> when, you, when you say review completed after closing, that's something new that I've never done. Um, what does that look like? And what does that review entail? Yeah, so, you know, Ultimately, um, on the checklist, I have a few items. Um, it's really reviewing your replacement cost and deductibles. You know, nowadays, roof covering is covered uh, very differently than it used to be covered. I mean, it used to be that you could just call in, get a claim, replace your roof, right? Pay a small deductible. These days, that's just not how it's working. Um, insurance companies have had to innovate and change the way that they um, provide roof coverage at the time of loss so that they can remain in the marketplace, believe it or not. I mean, it's, it's actually become a, a pretty big thing. Uh, insurance companies are um, limiting the amount of coverage provided on roofs. So they might be doing like an actual cash value um, on a roof that's older than 10 years. Um, there may be, um, you know, other, other things like a mandatory 1% or 2% of the dwelling amount wind and hail coverage. Um, you know, when you stack on depreciation with, you know, a, a $6,000 deductible, you, you end with not being covered. I mean, that's, that's essentially what happens. Perfect. So, um, I did, uh, invite a couple members of my team, Bruce, I hope that's okay. One of them Please. just popped through. Um, yep. I so. think you got host power. So yeah, um, it, oh. yeah, except away. Yeah, I have other people that I haven't heard of wanting to join in, so I'm just going to admit. Is that okay? <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, I'll, we'll kick them out if I don't know. Uh, who are they? Okay. Yeah, awesome. Elaine. Elaine's good. Yep. You met Elaine. She was on the live team for a while, too. Oh, Elaine, yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. Baron Deeren. Hey, good morning. What's up, B? Sorry about that. <laughs> no, I was just seeing your email. Um, I let Sean take over and I was like, who's having trouble? Who's not? And I saw it. So go. Yeah, That's I just cool. didn't see anything. So thank you so much. Yep. Always just a reminder, guys, always uh, the Wednesday uh, training class Zoom link is in the standing PC calendar. Um, it's the standing Zoom link for everything. But uh, we got okay. some new people on here. So we definitely want to make sure we reiterate that through our calls. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Go ahead, Sean. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and it's such a pleasure to get to, to help you guys. And Bruce, thank you so much for your, your uh, offering here and, and allowing me to, to speak with your team and um, have a number of things to chat with you about. Obviously, uh, we, we just kind of went into a tangent about um, pre-closing, post-closing reviews on your insurance. I think it's very important. Um, today, I have a presentation um, kind of outlining other things that may affect um, being able to close for insurance and, and what things to look for, um, you know, pre-closing, um, preferably way before you even maybe even start looking for a home for your client, maybe you start incorporating some of these behaviors and these activities so that you can um, in ensure that your clients have a smooth closing and that things don't, um, don't come up later on. You know, they, they, they leave insurance for the last minute. 
I literally, I got an evidence of insurance request four days before closing this week. And, you know, we, we are able to do it, but I mean, it's, you know, that I, I don't usually see that. Usually I see like 30 days, two weeks was like, it used to be two weeks was very, you know, a, a very short period of time to closing now, like four days. I mean, that, that just kind of blows my mind that that's happening. So, yep. um, so what I have here for you today is I have a, a presentation um, shortcomings in real estate transactions due to unexpected insurance challenges. So again, just to reiterate, I'm here to introduce another tool you can keep in your real estate toolbox. Um, we're here to educate and inform and how to prepare and qualify the people you work with for homeowners insurance. This presentation is a comprehensive guide to making aware what challenges could prevent you and your clients from having a smooth real estate transaction with regards to obtaining homeowners insurance. And before we jump into flipping slides, I, I want you for, for an instance, if you will, if, if you'll, if, if you'll uh, entertain me here on close your eyes. And I want you to imagine for a second, a successful, what you would consider to be a successful real estate transaction. Now, a, a successful real estate transaction may not be the same thing to everyone. I understand that. But for a moment, just, just conceptualize, what did that look like from start to finish? What, what, what happened? What steps happened and occurred that led to that successful real estate um, transaction? I want you to imagine that just for a moment. And, you know, ultimately you're having the best experience possible that you can with your client. Um, can everyone see this screen? Yeah, finish line ahead. Oh, okay. So, yep, you, you got the finish line ahead, right? You can see it. You can smell it. You can taste it. It's coming. You're about to close this deal. Um, it's happening. Um, it's the home stretch, the finish line. You can see it. Um, you can see the closing commencing without a hiccup and everything is falling in line appropriately. And you can add another homeowner to your yearly total of people you had the privilege of advocating for in their home purchase, right? Um, I'm not sure how you position yourself with your clients. I position myself as an advocate for my clients. I want to help them in the very best way possible. And, um, you know, ultimately, um, you know, this, this finish line is something many of you have seen. Hopefully you've seen this more often than not, but, um, you know, you've made it. Um, how many hundreds of steps are there in this process? Um, you know, how many steps can you remember? And also the steps that aren't always taken with each transaction. You know, every transaction is maybe a little bit different. Um, these steps may be routine for you, or you may be establishing these steps. Either way, you are your client's ultimate guide through the real estate process. Every transaction is different, each requiring their own succession of steps. At what step does the insurance conversation take place with your clients? Does it take place at all, or do you let it go to the lender before that conversation is made? Take a look at some of these milestones in the home buying process on this slide. Where do you incorporate the insurance conversation? I would like to know um, if you want to, um, you know, write your answers in the chat area or just kind of write your answers on your own. Um, when do you bring up the homeowner's question with your clients, if at all? Um, if you don't talk about it, please write that down as well. We, we want to know whether or not you do or do not talk about it. If you don't talk about it, that's fine. That's kind of why we're here. So, um, you know, these are some of the, the steps. You guys are the professionals. I don't necessarily know each step. Maybe you would include a um, hundred more steps in here, <laughs> right? Um, realistically speaking, I know that there's a lot of steps to this process. Um, where could the homeowner's insurance conversation be had um, during, during this process? Um, consider for a moment that the closing is right around the corner and something has come up that is preventing your buyers from obtaining homeowner's insurance. So now I'm taking that amazing dream, that amazing vision of that successful home closing, and, that, and now we're talking about it being ruined potentially um, due to homeowner's insurance challenges. Uh, this is an extenuating circumstance that has not come up before, however, is preventing the sale from going through. I wanna make sure that we make home insurance a priority in your, um, in your initial meetings with, with your clients so that these types of situations can be avoided. An overwhelming amount of buyers do not properly secure homeowner's insurance, leaving it often to the very last moment. Truly, I mean, it's one of the very last steps in the home closing process. Um, you know, I talked about how I get calls weekly from people needing to establish homeowner's insurance immediately. Uh, for, fortunately, like I said before, we do have the ability to do that in most situations. However, when things are left to the last moment, it doesn't give a buyer or agent time to compensate 
um, for any extenuating cir circumstances uncovered within the homeowner's insurance underwriting process. So whenever a closing date has to be pushed out, it can in inconvenience the sellers, the buyers, the agent, you know, really the entire team formulating this, this transaction, it can inconvenience everyone. And um, when there is difficulty in obtaining insurance within the timeline of the mortgage, it puts strain on that process and can cause a deal to fall through. Hey, Sean. Uh, lending parties will not lend to an individual or property that does not qualify for insurance. And not just any insurance, but very specific insurance policies qualify. And you know, if you have more questions about that, let me know. Um, but there's, there's a standard market and there's a non-admitted market for homeowners insurance. Some people fall into that non-admitted uh, side and, and ultimately most, you know, most lenders want to see a standard or an admitted marketplace product um, for their loan. Hey, Sean. Yeah. Hey, um, you said underwriting and, um, you know, I've, I've never, I, I thought underwriting was only for the lending world. Can you explain more to me? I'm just yeah. playing. I'm, I'm playing it. I'm I, playing it. I know. I know. Yeah. I know you're playing devil's advocate. Um, no, that's absolutely a great question. You know, ultimately, um, th there's homeowners uh, insurance underwriting. You know, there's underwriting. There's a lot of different factors and criteria and 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 things that go into that. And we're going to go over some of the things that could prevent underwriting from going through, or could could cause someone to be um, unqualified from an insurance underwriting perspective. Um, but yeah, the, the mortgage underwriting process is very extensive. Homeowners insurance uh, underwriting process is a little bit more behind the scenes. There's maybe a little less work. It's more just questions and answers, um, some of which could affect the, the, the closing process. I right know. Appreciate it. Yeah. Um, so quali qualifying your buyers for homeowners insurance right away is a useful skill as it further establishes you as a professional um, ensuring that you have all encompassing view of the client situa situation. There's nothing worse than thinking you're at the finish line than finding out you haven't even started yet, right? So this is a comprehensive guide again to qualify, identify, and educate you as the real estate professional to make informed decisions. As part of this journey, I will be providing resources to you to make the process of qualifying someone for homeowner's insurance simple and understandable. My goal is that this process may be easy enough for you to incorporate into your initial fact-finding meeting with your client and getting to know your client meetings. By doing this, you will be proactively preventing a shortcoming in your own transactions instead of reacting when it may be too late to do anything about it. So I'm not going to get into why homeowners insurance exists. However, here are some of the uh, main reasons why homeowners insurance exists uh, in general. So in essence, it really just pr protects the investment made by both parties. So what is part of the homeowner's insurance underwriting criteria, right? So what insurance companies look, look at when they look at um, a qualified uh, home, uh, person that can have a home, home policy, um, previous claims, condition of the structure and surrounding property, insurance score, risk-based score, breed of dogs, previous criminal record, newly immigrated to the United States, and wildfire risk score. So there are probably more factors than this. These are some of the top reasons that we're going to review. And if anyone has questions at all during this, just please interrupt me and let me know what questions, what's on your mind. If you want to save them to the end, that's fine too. I'd follow uh, Bruce's protocol for, for that. I got a question. Yep. What do you mean by wildfire risk score? So that that's kind of a, a big hot button lately. Um, I, I don't know. Um, mo most everyone probably saw or heard about the fires that occurred last year, um, the multiple fires. And so a wildfire risk score is a score that goes from zero to 90 on how likely a property is to burn due to a brush fire risk map that's, that's detailed for every single property. Every single property um, in the United States is, is categorized under the brush fire mapping system and um, anything over 60 is typically not approved through the standard market and would need underwriting exception to allow through. Um, we have had um, scores within the 60 to 90 range be approved on the standard market is really is just a case by case basis. Um, insurance companies look at a lot of different factors and criteria when assessing the brush fire risk score. Um, you know, uh, 
uh, some of those factors are, are business reasons, right? How much business does this client have with us? What is the business, you know, acceptability for this exception code? Um, one thing I've learned in my insurance career is that insurance is definitely not black, black or white. There, there's definitely gray area and there's definitely area for um, interpretation and discussion. And um, your agent can sometimes build a case for a particular client to allow something to go through that may be um, otherwise not approvable. Right on. Uh, one follow-up question from that. So let's pretend that your uh, wildfire risk score is within the acceptable limits. Um, everything goes well. And, um, and maybe this isn't part of the wildfire risk score, um, but maybe, uh, maybe it is. Let's say that they, you guys go, we get to closing, everything's in, in, in effect and in force. And then uh, the insurance company, I don't know how these work. I don't know if it's an audit or if it's an automatic site visit, but they do a drive-by of the property and it's a, you know, it's a property in the mountains and the real wildfire risk score was fine. But when they get there, uh, they notice that the entire, you know, property, uh, or, or I should say the dwelling is surrounded by multi, like just, just a forest of uh, evergreens. Um, I've heard that, you know, sometimes the, you have to, you have to clear out uh, different, different trees and different things away from the home. So that way it's less susceptible to some sort of fire like that. Does that have anything to do with any of that? It, it does. Um, and that's where some, sometimes the exceptions can come into play, the condition of the property and, and, and how much of a defensible area you've created from the house to the sources of fuel is kind of how they, how they categorize that, right? What can cause, um, you know, burning, what, what can ignite. Um, and so they do look at that. Um, I'll tell you that most companies have adopted a standard of about 150 feet of, um, you know, clearing underbrush and creating a defensible area to the house. 150 feet is not an easy task to accomplish. I mean, you're talking about, you know, days, sometimes weeks of clearing land, tractors. You cannot do this stuff by hand. I mean, it, it's multiple thousands and thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of dollars sometimes if you don't have your own equipment. Um, but removing trees and, and, and clearing underbrush so, um, you know, other examples of, of how likely something is to burn is, you know, sometimes in your, in your example, uh, Bruce, you know, people will take pictures of the property when the brush had been cleared. And then maybe the company, maybe the closing doesn't happen for eight, nine months after, you know, when it's actually being sold or, or the transactions going through. Well, guess what happened in that time? Thing, things grew. And so now there's, there's, you know, and then the, by the time the insurance company comes out there, it's not the same picture. So now the insurance company feels jaded. They're like, well, this is kind of a misrepresentation of this property. And so they will issue essentially a midterm cancellation or a non-renewal notice at that point. Um, you know, if it gets bad enough, they can, they can issue a, a short-term cancellation um, indicating that there is material misrepresentation on the application prior to submission. Um, again, I, I hope that never happens to you. Typically, um, it has to be very bad for that to happen. There's have to be a very large um, material misrepresentation for that to occur. Perfect. So I don't know if this is here. I, I don't know if you're going to talk about it later. And so just stop me if, if you are. Um, one of the houses that I purchased in Ohio, um, we, we got to the closing table, we did all of that. And then um, they did a, they did their site visits. Uh, what do you guys call that? Like when you guys drive by, like, can you break that down? Because sometimes it feels like, sometimes it feels like you, they do an inspection before close and I kind of understand what I need to do. And then a couple of times that I've closed is like the inspection happened afterwards. And then this one time I got hit with, Hey, you have uh, three months to replace your roof. Um, and, you know, throughout the inspection, the roof checked out fine. Um, you know, there was some, there was some granular loss and we had a roofer come out, check it out. Um, basically had a stamp of approval for it. And, um, the insurance company basically, I mean, for lack of better words, trumped what kind of evidence I could find. And they were just like, look, we did a site visit and you need to replace this in the next three months or we will drop you as an insurance company. Um, I was going to replace the roof already, but I can't imagine being like a first time home buyer going through all of that and, and, and hitting that. So I wanted to bring it up because it happens and you know, there's not really a, a rhyme or reason to it. Um, I talked to a couple different insurance companies and they all pretty much told me the same thing. Um, it was just an after the fact thing. And so it's just something that, you know, I, I want everybody on this call to understand like 
insurance company has their policies, procedures, their guidelines, what they do and what they can't. They don't give a crap about what your inspector said. Your inspector is not a licensed roofer. Even a licensed roofer can say, yeah, the roof's going to last for a long time and, and for a while, but the, ins the insurance company can still trump that because that's their policy. It's their business. And I, I just, I find, I find the common public doesn't, can't differentiate from different businesses, right? Why the lender requires this, but the title company doesn't. Well, if you want the loan, that's what you're going to have to do. If you want insurance, that's what you're going to have to do. Am I wrong, Sean? I kind of went off there for a second. No, no, you're hundred percent correct. <clears throat> Hello, did I freeze? Have their own standards for the transaction, and you know you can't um, you can't assume some something's going to happen, and you know ultimately all insurance companies kind of um, kind of talk. Hey, John, um, yeah. I I think you cut out um, as soon as you started talking. I, I couldn't hear you for like ten or fifteen seconds. Did anybody else do that? I want to make sure it's on the recording. I think yeah, it was yeah. he cut out for me. Okay. Can, can you hear me okay? fine now? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, cool. Let, let me know if that happens again. Um, I do have next light here at my office, but um, you never know with technology. It um, looks like Kim Coleman might have a question too before I forget to say. Oh, Kim, no, do you have sorry, a question? I, I don't. I don't know what happened with that either. Kim, oh, okay. I, I think I, I raised your hand accidentally. I was clicking buttons and uh, <laughs> I, I volunteered you to, uh, to ask a question. No, Kim, Kim's part of uh, our insurance team. Kim, thanks so much for joining us here. Um, she's an independent agent um, in, in the Northeastern Colorado area. So. Right on. Um, so yeah, I was, as I was saying that, you know, every, every team member in this real estate transaction has a different, um, you know, a different set of guidelines, different different set of expectations and underwriting uh, classifications. So uh, the, the inspection process um, is something that I don't go into in this presentation, um, you know, in depth. So I'll, so I'll definitely mention it here, but um, there's no guarantee that you will need to have an inspection. Typically when there's something indicated on the application that would warrant the company to invest in, in, an, in, in an inspection is when you're gonna see that. So for, for example, if you have a roof that's over 10 years old documented on the policy without proof of roof updating, that could trigger the underwriter to say, okay, um, we need to go ahead and order. We need to invest in this inspection as a, as a risk standard so that we can possibly eliminate our risk exposure on this particular property. So um, in that instance, you know, the, the company is gonna send out an inspector typically within 72 hours if, if they do, um, you know, you know, see justification to sending out an inspector. They are going to do that within 72 hours. That inspector is going to come out. It's going to be probably a third party inspector, and they're going to be inspecting the property based off the standards of the insurance company. And so um, in insurance companies pretty much have the same standards if they're in the admitted or standard lines market in the state of Colorado. It's a very regulated industry. So the insurance commission um, basically dictates what those standards are to two clients and to, to Bruce's point, um, or two insurance companies, to Bruce's point, when, when you have a roofer go out there, the roofer might say, this roof's fine, it doesn't need to be replaced. Well, it's because the insurance company has a different standard than the roofers. And so the roofer is looking at, you know, you know, worst case scenario, how long does this roof have? Okay, you don't have to replace it this year, maybe it has one more year. Well, in the state of Colorado, insurance companies pretty much have to replace roofs if they have eight hail hits per square of roofing material. So eight hail hits in, in just one square in the roof will, will total a roof. And so um, some people think that those standards are very um, loose or uh, the, you know those standards are very easy to total roofs and they are. Um, and that's why it gets into a situation where your roofer could write a certification or you go through all this, all this you know, rigmarole of doing that. And then the company's like, yeah, we still have our standards this roof needs to be replaced on your dime. And, and as, as a result, the company is, is doing a, uh, you know, a business transaction at that point. I mean, they, they are um, having business justifications to um, you know, their business and, and saying, okay, this is going to benefit us. This, is, this meets our standards. And so we can justify this this way. Um, it, it's, it's not a, always a good situation to be in. You know, um, your agent should know 
when things are going to need a roof inspection or you know when those types of things are going to come to fruition and um, should should be able to um, advise on that you know we always ask one of the first questions we ask when we're quoting a home policy is um, do you you know when was the roof replaced well here in here in Colorado it, it's a pretty good likelihood it was replaced within the last 10 years I mean we've gotten some pretty massive hailstorms and insurance companies know that too um, so yeah um, you know, it's, it's going to be a third party inspector. They're going to go out at the discretion of the insurance company. Once they see criteria on the application that may warrant the insurance company to, to invest in that inspection. And that's, what's going to kind of trigger that. Um, ultimately that'll happen probably 72 hours after you issue the policy. So issuing a policy is not the same as when the policy goes into place. So again, we we're used to about a 30 days lead time before a home closing to put a policy in place. So we would issue it, the company would get those documentation, they would send out that documentation to the client in the form of declaration pages and policy documents, and then they would order the inspection if needed. And so it is very possible that the inspection could, could occur before the company has to be on the risk at the time of, of the effective date. Now, if we're getting these evidence of insurance requests, you know, four, four days before closing, it's a very good chance that that inspection won't happen until after closing um, effectively. So it's, it's one of those things where when, when you can understand that inspection process and, and the timing of that, it can help you understand what things you may, may need to do um, in, in order to get that property and that transaction to, to a better place where closing um, is, is likely. So um, here is a picture of a burst pipe, right? So this happens. Um, this is just one of the losses that we experience. This is typically an automatically covered loss and in, in, in a home policy um, and uh, can, can be quite devastating. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. <laughs> you know, so Ultimately, claims um, that have been made on both the property and the individual may affect insurability. So you may ask yourself, well, you know, um, you know, this claim was made on the, pr you know, pr on the prior owner. Um, you know, why is it affecting my client's ability to be insured on this property? Well, it, well, it does because it shows the history and susceptibility the property may be to further claims. So if that type of water breakage is happening, um, you know, two to three times every five years, it probably shows that there's some sort of pressure problem or some sort of plumbing problem in that house and insurance companies may not want to be on that risk. So all claims are reported to a national reporting agency um, under what's called a clue report. So you can always have your insurance agent run a clue report of a particular property before possibly wanting to, to purchase it. Um, and that sometimes is a good um, you know, good, good exercise and just understanding what the risk report is of that particular property. Um, obviously, that might be, you know, a very large task to ask of your insurance agent, especially if you're looking at dozens and dozens of properties. Um, but nonetheless, if you have one that maybe you're, you're expecting, um, you know, multiple losses to, to occur in or, or have occurred in, it may be a good thing to, to reach out and, and ask for assistance. Um, yeah. I want to touch on that real quick uh, yeah. for just to give them food for thought about what I do. Uh, yeah, I yeah I do not recommend over inundating your insurance rep on on clue reports for every house you're going to see. Um, I rarely even ask for them. What I do is I go under contract, and if there's anything throughout the showing, so you guys all know what I do when I go on showings. I look at the home, um, not through the eyes of the buyer to live there, but through the eyes of just how it's built, what I can see, um, and anytime I see any sort of water damage on ceilings. Um, you know, in cat, kitchen or uh, cabinets uh, under sinks, um, all of those different things. If I can see a shoddy repair or something like that, that would maybe cause me um, even a even a brand new roof. You know, you get brand new roof, brand new siding, and all of that. Um, why? What happened? Where is it at? Is there? You know, did it have a, a roof leak? Did the mold get taken care of in the attic? Um, a lot of people, a lot of people that have something happen to their home, they might not want to pay the deductible. And so they'll do a shoddy job of repair or they'll do a professional job just to save that deductible, and not have it hit their insurance. But then, then you don't know how well it was taken care of. And the biggest thing that I've ever seen is whenever I see a shoddy drywall repair in a ceiling from some sort of water leak, I have to question whether or not that water was totally mitigated. 
um, because is there just mold just continuing to fester and grow up in that attic? And so some of those things is what I, what I look for in order to then ask for a clue report to see what I'm looking at and where it's at. And sometimes the clue report will kind of validate what I saw and make me feel pretty comfortable because there were so many things done to the property to bring it up back up. Absolutely. Bruce, are, are those items that are typically caught in the inspection? They are. I just, I, when I teach people how to show a home, I, I, I teach them to look around for just the obvious, right? If your ceiling looks yellow, let's go ahead and point that out to the buyer so that way they know what they're getting into because in this market, there's no guarantee the seller is going to fix it even if we do find mold. And then you're under contract, you're through inspection, possibly even paid for your appraisal already. So I typically try not to wait too long until there, but I'm not like going invasive like through the home like an inspector would. Yeah, that's an awesome, that's an awesome strategy to have. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, uh, the claim stays with the individual and the property. Um, so when that individual leaves that house and goes to look for another house, that claim's going to stay with them. That claim's also going to stay with the property, typically for a period of five years, and then it's going to drop off. Um, and not necessarily be reported. However, I have seen larger claims stick on a clue report. And even though the insurance company doesn't have a lot of merit or weight in that claim, um, you know, from over five years ago, they still use it in their risk determination of that property. So, um, you know, ultimately, um, you know, you can ask your insurance agent, definitely don't, don't overburden them on that, but, but use, use Bruce's strategy on, on coming up with that understanding. Um, yeah, insurance yeah. agent, I can't stress this enough. Your vendor partners are your everything. And the last thing you want to do is, is, is be, the last thing you want to do is be a buyer who wants to go see 50 houses before they put the first offer in. And then they don't even put the right offer in that, that to me would be like, if I was insurance rep and somebody was asking me to, to, to do 12 clue reports for 12 showings that I'm going to go see this weekend. And my buyers maybe not be pre-approved or something like that. Sean is going to feel compelled because he's a partner of yours, uh, but it's going to piss him off. I'm just going to be straight up honest with you. And, and it, would do the, it would do the same thing for you if you had a buyer that wanted to see 50 homes. But you know what I mean? So it's a balance and, and you, you need to have a relationship with your vendors. That's why Sean's on here. Appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you, Bruce. Um, so the, the most common previous claim is accidental discharge of water from burst pipes. And that's also why I had that picture there. So if you thought that was kind of there for random purposes, I'm kind of tying that in here a little bit. Um, oh, sprinkler. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sprinkler discharge. Uh, if someone has a sprinkler system in their home, some, some, some insurance companies actually look at that as a negative because there's accidental discharge of that sprinkler system more than there's actually the saving of a fire or saving of a loss from that system. But um, but yeah, I mean, that, that accidental discharge of water is the most common claim, um, especially here in Colorado, when we have these deep freezes that happened maybe a few weeks ago, um, you know, we, we always have some claims that pop up. Um, homes in Colorado are made to certain standards. The standards change every year. Code changes every single year. And so homes that were made, you know, back in the 50s are going to have a different level of standard um, to the homes that are made today. Um, and so a lot of people think that roof claims are the most common type of loss, but it's actually accidental discharge of water. So I thought that might be kind of a, an interesting tidbit for you guys. Um, the second most common claim is, is roof claims for wind and hail. So in Colorado, um, you know, the average 30 year roof maybe lasts 10 years, maybe, um, you know, before an insurance company would determine that it would need to be replaced. The average, um, you know, impact resistant shingle, 50 year shingle lasts an average of 15 years. So um, you know, that, the, the, you know, again, a product that's rated for 50 years only lasts 15 years in Colorado. That goes to show how tremendously in flux our weather systems are um, here and, and insurance companies know it. Um, more than two claims in a three or five year period can impact insurability. This holds true now more than ever. Insurance companies are so incredibly strict on previous claims. I just cannot tell you that enough. Um, if you have more than two claims on your record in five years, you, you probably will not be able to get homeowner's insurance these days. So um, it would have to be a very large business justification for an insurance company to, to justify providing coverage on, a, on someone's home when they had more than two claims. Um, it is an exception for us. My company does rate that 
um, fairly heavily. Um, and that would warrant you stepping into that surplus lines market or looking into a product that was possibly more expensive, um, you know, and, and maybe not as advantageous for the client to consider with, with all these little bells and whistles that maybe they want in their policy. John, I've got a question right there because it, it, this, this is one of those things that's, that's kind of, I can see it from the insurance company's world because it's, let's face it, it's a business. And then I can see it from the consumer's world. Like, let's just say like, there's just this fluke three years in a row, just this terrible, terrible hailstorm. Is that something like that, that, you know, it's like an act of God. It's a brand new roof. It was insured through the first time. A reputable roofing company did it. There's nothing wrong with the shingles. There's no defects or anything like that and they get ransacked three years in a row. Is that something that your company or, or you see, not maybe not even just your company, but you see like that can kind of um, have a variance to it? Un unlike like, like pipes, like pipes, you know, that are 20 years old, you get a couple of different leaks in there. Like I can see why the insurance company goes, hey, look, they're 20 years old. Like we're not gonna keep insuring these pipe leaks, pay for somebody to replace the pipes. But on something like a roof, like what does that look like? Yeah. And so at, at the end of the day, the insurance company has the right to approve or deny a risk. Um, you know, and can I say that as an agent, will I take the time to explain to my company that, hey, this was an act of God. This wasn't by any negligence of the client. You know, will I do that? Absolutely. At the end of the day, the company reserves the right to um, not write the risk. And um, I, I have seen that the insurance company really does not care for lack of better words if it was an act of god or if it was the homeowner's negligence what it shows is it shows a pattern of loss and yep. to the insurance company that is what they care about they care about the pattern of loss whether that's an act of god or not if you're in this hail area where the clouds open up right there on that specific spot every single year the insurance Ooh. company's not going to want to write that if, yep. if you if you were let's say you had one claim can that, can that increase your rate that you would be willing to take on? In other words, um, someone who's had zero claims, would they get a better rate than somebody who might have had one in the last five years? I would say almost certain, certainly yes. Um, that's true, Harry. Uh, thank you for your question. Um, you know, ultimately, no claims is way better than even one, and any more than one is almost in ineligible. And so... Um, that's how tight, that's how tight of a margin that the companies are working on these days. I mean, you know, insurance, people can look at insurance however they want. Ultimately, insurance is such an essential part of our homeland security in, in general. I mean, our, our nation would not be able to exist right now without insurance, in my belief. I mean, that's why I'm an insurance agent. Um, but, you know, the company does have to make money. They have to have money to pay for their claims. They have to make money to, to pay for the administrative staff. They have to, you know, make a profit. They would like to make a profit. Although the property and casualty side of the business where you put homeowners insurance is considered property and casualty insurance always runs at a loss. So if you're working with an insurance company that's very heavy on the PNC side and they don't differentiate their business lines, that company is probably going to have more strict guidelines to claims than a company that has more broad vertical integration in the market, such as life insurance, financial products, and other uh, uh, revenue generation products. So um, that, that's really a good consideration of, of, of where that company's at. I, I'm not, of course, not gonna name any names of, of companies. Um, I, I don't like talk, talking badly about companies or, or anyone else, but there are companies out there that even if the, you've been with them for 30 years, you file that one hail claim, they will, you're out, you know, and, mm -hmm. and yeah. It is it the house or the person? The claim is really both. It's both. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So somebody might be buying a house, had no idea that they'd had two claims on it, might make the insurance company look at it and say, for whatever reason, the age of the home or whatever, this 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 is a risk for this house. It, exactly. It it absolutely can be. And and given Harry that insurance companies again, they're gonna they're going to take into consideration multiple factors and they're going to consider the agents write up, um, you know, like for complicated risks like this, that we really want to try, I'll submit a cover letter to the underwriter and I'll explain it in maybe a one or two page document um, outlining why maybe we should consider this risk. Um, you know, other times you kind of know by looking at the claim history, 
yeah, there, there's no way underwriting is going to approve it. Now it used to be just two years ago, actually, when I made this presentation just two years ago, my company would accept three, four losses in the last five years. So just in the last two to three years, the insurance companies have tightened their margin because the, the money is tighter. Um, and, you know, um, th there's a number of different factors that are involved with that. The cost of construction, the cost of putting on a new roof has exponentially increased over the years. The, the whole roofing industry, um, you know, has changed substantially as well. So I hope that answers your question, Harry. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so also it's, it's claim amount. It's not necessarily number of claims. It's also the, the amount of the claim. So one claim more than $25,000 in payout can affect insurability as well. Um, are they selling that old house to get away from its problems? You always kind of have to wonder why they're selling it. Yes, we're in a, you know, people are taking out their equity. There's a lot of reasons people are selling it, but you know, like my in-laws, goodness gracious, they have a house up on the hill. They have a seventies build. And this house has nothing but problems. I mean, it's got foundation issues. It's got, and they've, you know, bless their souls. They've just repaired everything um, themselves. But there's, I don't know, maybe Bruce, you've come into that situation where people are selling homes to just get away from the problems or, you know, get into a new build where they don't maybe have those problems. Maybe they have different problems when they get a new build, but. Yeah, you know, um, I have, I've never had somebody just come out and say it because they want me to sell their home, right? But I do, I have, I have absolutely um, felt that way. You know, the way that they talk about their home and the kind of the way they beat it up when they go, but the reasons why they're moving isn't really a reason. I mean, they're just kind of la making a lateral move into a house that's very similar in size and layout and structure and criteria. And they just continue to beat up the home. So those are just some things that you guys want to pick up on. Um, but no, I don't really have anybody that just directly says, I got to get the heck out of here. There's so many <laughs> issues with this home because they know that I'm trying to sell. And if they, they, they people are shady, um, that's, that's why sometimes the insurance world is kind of strict with some things. Um, if people would just do the right thing in this world, um, I don't think we'd have a, a, a strict of an insurance piece. Um, I'm sure Sean gets questions all day long, uh, or not all day long, but all month long, and it, he can pick up on who's trying to pull one over on something. You, you guys know you're working with the general public. You you tend to tend to learn things about people's tendencies, and and uh, you know when you're when you're working with you know an asset worth hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars. Um, you know, the, the reason to get out of that may not be as apparent. So obviously if you see a, a house like this in this picture, um, it's definitely gonna cause for some, some concern. Um, you're probably gonna end up just walking away from it. You're gonna be like, well, is the land for sale? Because no one's probably gonna put <laughs> this house, um, you know, in this, in this reason. Obviously this, this house is, in, insur is not insurable. Um, it looks like a remodeling project gone bad. Um, do you ever look at a house and wonder what's its history? You know, I see pictures on Facebook posted all the time where like people put power outlets inside of sinks. I always wonder if those pictures are real, but you know, you just got to wonder like, why, why was this a do it upper? Like, was this a joke or were they serious about, you know, putting this in that, in that location? Um, you know, what, what has the property gone through? Um, how many remodeling projects? The condition, and who did those remodeling projects? Was it the owner that did the remodeling? Did they hire a, 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 a contractor and do it professionally? Um, a lot of people are do-it-yourselfers, they, they, they remodel. The, the um, fact is, is that if, if you don't have an occupation in remodeling, you're probably not as skilled as a remodeler as, as someone that does it for a living every single day. Um, so, you know, th there's always those pieces. Um, the condition of the home is one of the largest determinations of qualification. Uh, the history of the home can tell a story about what the property has gone through. Um, and uh, to connect this together, previous claims and running a clue report can shed a lot of light into what condition the property is. And inspection is, is a good resource for this as well. Um, if you're in a county that has high expectations and high standards on their um, uh, their permitting processes. Um, another good resource would be the county website to look at, you know, what, what, is, what permits have been filed, um, you know, what permits have been out. That kind of does show you some of the repair history. Was an addition made? Um, is that addition being made to cover up another loss that occurred? You know, there, there's all these types of questions that may come up later on um, at, at that time as well. So, um, 
Most of the time, what will happen is the lending part party will strongly recommend to the buyers to start looking for insurance. So um, they're going to recommend to start looking for insurance on the home and property before the inspection is complete. Often buyers will secure insurance before the inspection doing their due diligence, you know, often at the recommendation of their of their loan officer 30 days prior to closing, sometimes even 60 days prior to closing if everything is in order. Because of how busy we are, there's a lot of reasons why maybe we're not getting um, you know, this, long, this, this much of a lead time um, to plan accordingly. Maybe that's why we're getting the, the week or two week notice. Maybe Bruce can touch on that a little bit more. But um, you know, usually in a market where we're not so busy, I see that the lead times are at least 30 days prior to closing. Um, Often buyers will secure insurance um, at this point in the process. They may, they may be a good two to four weeks before the official closing the loan. During this time, the inspection takes place um, and, and to touch on the inspection process, the insurance company, the insurance company will also send out a third party inspector to give the home a once over. The insurance company can come back and deny, again, just to reiterate on this point, the insurance on the home because of criteria found in this inspection, like the roof not meeting certain criteria. This is one of the largest points of contention in any real estate transactions, a roof in Colorado. Um, uh, is, is that true, Bruce? Is the roof one of the largest points of contention when it comes to the home condition or what needs to be fixed? Or is there another item that's bigger than that, just for my knowledge? Yeah, I would say it's, 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 it's roof as well as maybe furnace. Um, you've got so many new builds that were built in the early 2000s right now with original furnaces. Um, and so I, I see those two types of things, um, but a furnace, an old furnace isn't really necessarily covered uh, through insurance unless you have Sean Browning. So we'll get to that it soon. It could be. <laughs> yeah, we'll get to that soon. Um, yeah. But I have a hypothesis. I don't know if it's true, but I think, I think the reason why you're seeing some of these, I guess, rushed kind of insurance type of looks and claims being brought up in the middle of the, the process Sean, is because right now, I mean, us as agents, we're going into homes and we're seeing some things that might be wrong with the home. And I think a lot of us aren't, aren't aware of maybe what could be an insurance claim and maybe what isn't. And maybe the homeowner decided, this happened to my house, X, Y, Z. I covered it up a bit. I didn't want to pay the deductible because my agent said, just put it on the house. In this market, it will sell. Then the buyer goes through with an agent who does not look at the home and they like the home, they like the layout, but no one ever looked at the ceiling. No one ever looked at it, whatever X, Y, Z. And then they get to the inspection piece and then the inspector puts on there, hey, this, this, and this is wrong. And buyer may have put something in like, hey, I'm not going to ask for any major, you know, I'm not going to ask for anything but a major item to be repaired or fixed. And then they bring it up and then the seller goes, well, I guess now is the time to call insurance. Um, I just don't think people are doing it when it happens, um, maybe a lack of money or maybe whatever that is, and then they go under contract and it's the easiest way, hope maybe for the seller to save a buck on having to, you know, shell out $10,000 to repair it. Buyer's happy and satisfied and everybody gets to the closing table, but that, that's my hypothesis. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I literally have transactions that I'm thinking about in my head as you're explaining that, that have literally happened exactly like that. Um, you know, I had one where one of our clients wanted to sell the home and then the, the buyers wanted to replace the roof, just like what you're saying. And, um, he, he wanted to file the claim and he wanted to have the claim completed and finished within four days. Yeah, and uh, I mean, it's just, you know, even, even the, I mean, we have a five-star rated claim service and I mean, we, we probably would have had it done within maybe a week and a half, two weeks, but, um, they had to push out the closing and the buyers, that were purchasing the home, that transaction fell through. They wanted to, you know, get a house within their timeline. There's some some sort of contingency on their end, and you know, ultimately, proactively planning is always a good um, a good strategy in, in any regard. And and in your guys' occupations, it's hard. It's hard to come up with and think about all of the moving parts. I mean, I look up to you guys as realtors. I mean, you you truly do have a, a you know quite a tremendous responsibility to your clients and and society in general, but um, hopefully I will be able to make at least one part of that process for you a little bit easier with some of the tools that we're going to introduce and show you here um, once we're done with the presentation. So, Yep, bingo. I, I, can't, I can't stress that enough, you guys. 
uh, we're going to be doing a mock listing presentation on Friday from two to four um, in Frederick. And um, I, I can't tell you, I cannot stress enough when you guys are walking through, it's just like on the buyer side right now on the buyer side, you have to make sure you interpret the market. You explain it hand over fist, but on the selling side, you really need to go through that house with them and you really need to understand what it is that can make that entire process that much easier if it's just done up front. And, and sometimes you need, to, you need to be aware of something that is wrong with the home because it's our, it's, our, it's our duty to disclose to the other side. And if you even can have a cognitive thought around it could be an insurance claim type of situation, have that conversation with your seller right then and there. Figure out why they didn't do it the first time around. Figure out kind of what's going to happen down the road, because if you see it, darn well, an inspector is going to see it, right? And if you already have that conversation with your seller, they may be more likely to then file that claim because you've already put it in their head versus a buyer hitting your seller with, hey, look, we don't, uh, we don't like this roof or whatever, the, whatever it is, right? You're not going to see a roof from, from there, but um, whatever that is. You get my drift. Have that conversation up front because when you hit somebody with something, an emotion stirs up. And sometimes, you know, we always say it's the second thought that counts. Let's wait a day. Let's, let's let the emotion settle down and make a rational decision. Have those conversations with your seller up front. And then when the buyer hits them, they kind of already have thought through it in their head. Um, that's just another piece of what I do, especially uh, with this topic that we're talking about on the listing side of things. Absolutely. I think I think timing is everything as well. I mean, everything can be timed well. Um, if an insurance agent does not communicate the results of the inspection to the client during that 30 day period and try to repivot and pivot quickly to, to try to switch up insurance so that, you know, the, the closing can go through. Um, you know, if the insurance agent does not communicate the results to the client to tell them coverage is being rescinded, they could get to the closing table without valid insurance. Um, and at that point, you know, everyone's going to be sitting at the table and they're going to say, you don't have insurance, you know, we can't close on this loan. Um, again, no lender is going to close on a loan without valid insurance. So I, I have a question and this is not me playing. I have no clue actually. So let's pretend that you you're, you're in your house and you go through and you have that unfortunate event. Let's just use that same example. Let's go three and four years in a row. You have to, you have a hail claim and whatnot. And all of a sudden the insurance company, you know, wants to drop you let's just say this that we're beyond they won't they won't um they won't insure you on the claim they want to drop you but your lender says you have to have adequate homeowners insurance i mean it, what where's where do you go i mean if you get dropped by one company and you have this national clue report what other kind of insurance company is going to pick you up and like how does that i have no idea how that works on a loan i'm probably going to ask a lender now um does that make sense? Now, are you talking, Bruce, before the closing or after the closing? After the closing. So can, after can the insurance closing, company drop. Well, I, I would I would absolutely um, love to get input from a lender's side, but in my experience, what the lender is going to do is they're going to force place hazard insurance on the um, on on the the person that's loan that's lending you know that's that's getting the money for the loan um, that's receiving the the funds to live in that house. Um, you know, that, that borrower is going to, um, have force place hazard insurance on them if their insurance company doesn't, um, you know, doesn't accept the risk or rescinds the, the, the acceptance of the application at that point, you know, it, what I do is I would broker it out to a number of other companies. Hopefully that agent has, you know, other opportunities to place insurance in. Um, the force place hazard insurance by, by, by mortgages is very expensive. It's also not very good coverage. It's not, it's not in the best interest of the borrower for their needs. It's in the best interest of the, of the mortgage company. And oh, so, okay. I think I totally get it. So force place ha uh, hazard insurance would just be probably an elevated premium, but what they're really covering is the loan balance most likely. Exactly. That's really the only thing that they, they would be covering. It'd be a very limited form on an insurance, probably wouldn't cover personal property of the client, uh, may have a very large deductible, but would still cover the investment of the mortgage company. Right on. I learned two things today. Here we go. No, I, I love I love this back and forth too. I, I love the conversation that reestablishes re my belief in these products and, and kind of what that process looks like and just how important what each and every one of you do for your clients, uh, how important that is to them and, 
and, and in their home buying process. And um, it's very important. So. so in some respects, let's say you buy the house as is and boy, the roof's shot, the furnace is shot. The odds of getting insurance on that home drop substantially, correct? It can, again, depending on that insurance company's uh, criteria. If I go into a, a property or risk and I know, I, I, you know, people brought it to my attention and, and they've disclosed that, hey, the roof's shot, um, it's terrible. I already know it's not gonna qualify for my company. Um, so I already know I'm gonna have to look for a company that's going to be willing to write an exclusion on the roof for that property, which those companies do exist. The premiums are typically a lot higher. Um, they, the, the coverages, the other ancillary coverages are probably not as good. So that exclusion would be until they replace that roof and then they could renegotiate that, correct? Exactly. They would be able to okay. renegotiate that with the insurance company. Usually can be done midterm, okay. um, depending on the insurance company at, at renewal at the very last, um, you know, worst, worst possible case. Okay. Yeah. Good question. Um, so th th this is some of the most common reasons why, um, you know, inspections fail. Um, I'm going to put on there uh, furnace as well, Bruce. Thank you for, for that information. Um, uh, update this here. Because the roof is the first line of defense a home has from the elements falling from above and also one of the most common claims, it is always important to know the condition of the roof of the home you are selling or buying. Insurance companies want to limit the amount of claims payouts by conducting selective underwriting for properties that have a greater propensity for a claim, right? So wood shake roofs are typically not eligible these days, even though they are very good um, hail resistant roof. Like you'll have wood shake shingles that have lasted you know, decades, a lot longer than asphalt shingle roofs do. But the problem with wood shake roofs is that they're a fire hazard. They can ignite very quickly um, and, and sometimes without direct, direct fire or direct flame on the, on the shingle itself. So wood shake shingles um, are, are not necessarily a, a roof material. Asbestos shingles, T-lock roofs, you know, those are always the, always the type of roofs that are really not advisable. If your roof, if your client, I'm going to add this here to this, but um, another really big thing to look at, look at is overlaid shingles. If you have three layers of shingles, there is absolutely zero companies, standard or not admitted from my experience, that will approve that, that roof with that shingle overlaid. Um, even, there's companies out there that still do two layers? So yeah, and even two layers is not acceptable, but we do have a, we do have a, a market for a two layer roof three layer I found out will not be accepted. <laughs> so I didn't even know two layer could be, I guess. So that that's good food for thought. Yeah. And Bruce, I'm not entirely sure why insurance companies don't like multiple layers of the roof, but it probably has to do with rot underneath each layer. If, if you haven't pulled back that shingle um, for three layers of shingles for possibly, you know, 30, 40, 50 years, there's probably some pretty substantial damage underneath um, those layers. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I talked to an uh, inspector about it. It's, if you think about the concept of how a roof is laid, you have to put the, uh, you know, the, the, basically the tar paper down first. That's, that's kind of like a waterproofing barrier that kind of helps if there's any seepage or anything like that. And so if you put a, a, a roof layer on top of a roof layer, you can't put, you can't put the tar, the tar paper down. So Sean's right. You, you can't really, it's not, it's not installed the way shingles are supposed to be installed. They're supposed to be on top of a tar paper. And so if they're not, and you put it over top of another roof, yeah, you're right. If, if you had to replace that roof already and just laid it on top, then there was already damage. That, that damage is, is likely to continue. It's just the law of physics. It's called oxidation. It's called, there's so many different terms for it, right? And so uh, the other thing that the inspector told me was, um, think about it. Have you, have you, has anybody ever picked up a bundle of shingles? They're extremely heavy. Okay. And, and, and on a common roof, I mean, it's, it's no joke to have 20, 30, 40, 50 bundles of shingles put on a roof. So now you take that weight, times it by three. Gosh, you give us a two foot snowfall. That trust system, it, it, it may or may not be built to hold that. 
Um, so a lot of times what the, what the instructor told me is, is especially in the mountain towns, it's, it's roof load. They have to have a, or, um, yeah, what do they call it? Roof load. They have to, um, in certain counties in the mountains, you cannot build a property up there unless you have a certain type of uh, roof truss system because of the snow load, let alone having three layers on there that honestly, a layer of shingles is going to weigh much more than probably 12 inches of snow, but even 12 inches of snow kind of can buckle a roof truss. So I think there's, there's a lot of different variances there, uh, rot, roof load, just why cover it up? I mean, it's not installed correctly. It needs to be on top of tar paper. I, you can keep going, you know? Nice. Yeah. And, you know, talking about roof, roof material, I would like to further um, take, take a moment to encourage you to recommend to your clients to install an impact resistant roof material. Um, you know, if you're selling a home and that's a contingency, um, there's a lot of counties now that are requiring that. So uh, uh, I do believe Fort Collins, city of Fort Collins requires a UL4 rated shingle to be installed. There are a number of other counties that are picking that up. Um, it, it, it usually really doesn't cost any more to install those. And it's really just better if, if everyone had a UL4 rated shingles, I think that our insurance costs would go down. Um, our, our insurance company provides a 25% discount for a new roof and a 25% discount for an impact resistant roof. Um, and so that, that savings is usually more than what it would cost even to put on that additional shingle. So definitely consider um, advocating for the people that you know to, to install a UL4 rated roof. I know. So talking about other issues that may happen, um, you know, obviously this is a big problem here. Um, you have a huge foundation issue. Bruce, have you ever seen a house like this? <laughs> Not quite that severe, but the Not beginning, better. the beginning of it. That's a that's a tall tale sign when you guys have a window or anything that's a vertical line like that with bricks cracking. Um, no, I've never seen anything that severe, but I've seen something where if it didn't get fixed, it was going to be that way in a couple of years. I, I found this on Google. I, I do have a source site uh, sources cited page, so um, you know I do give credit. But yeah, this is pretty extreme. Um, most likely undergoing renovation. Um, in more ways than one. So um, when you have a condition, um, a foundational or structural issue um, of all the situation and occurrences that can prevent insurability, foundation issues may seem like the largest. However, in reality, earth movement is not usually a covered loss on a home policy. So if something like this happens, um, you know, it's, it's really not going to be covered by insurance. Large foundation issues like in, in this previous picture would prevent insurability. However, small cracks would not. Rot, mold, fungi, and mildew will prevent insurability as these issues are covered, um, are typically covered in a home policy, but are limited um, at a certain amount of coverage because as you know, once mold starts getting through the house, it, it can go everywhere. So insurance companies do typically limit the amount of, of mold coverage that they provide or exclude it altogether. So definitely something to look for, but um, you know, there's certain cracks that aren't a concern. Um, horizontal cracks typically are, are, are okay. Vertical cracks, as, as Bruce indicated, are, are a sign that the, that the foundation is shifting and, and moving down or up or, or over. And so those are issues for, on an insurance front, even though um, insurance really wouldn't cover the ground movement or foundation issues at that point. So let's switch gears here and talk about vintage homes. Do we, do, does anyone here sell, uh, specialize or sell vintage homes in, in Longmont or surrounding areas? I mean, yeah. I mean, I think if you get- <laughs> All homes, right? <laughs> yeah, if you get an old, old town anywhere, um, you're probably looking at a lot of these. So vintage homes are some of the most unique, beautiful and inspiring homes. Um, if kept in good condition, um, it is important to go through the vintage home and to be aware of what updates have and have not been made. One of the largest updates most insurance companies look for is the electrical. Most insurance companies will require that the home is upgraded to 10 amp uh, circuits or more um, as most elect electronics of homes are sustained at this level. Um, in addition, when older homes have 100 amp or less, there is a heightened risk of fire. Vintage homes are always more expensive to insure as they are made with unique building materials and, and construction concepts that I'm admitting someone into the meeting here. Um, 
so the, they're made with um, unique building materials, but not only unique building materials, but also unique building methods that are not in existence today that add to the value of that property pretty substantially. Um, you know, there's some really cool older construction methods that don't, uh, they don't use today because of cost, because it, it literally costs more to, 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 for a carpenter to, to build things in that way. Um, also, those building materials may not be available today. So the cost of construction for light kind and quality may increase. Um, automatically, when a home is older than, you know, 1930s, they typically uh, qualify for that vintage uh, home construction standard. And that standard does increase the, the cost of, of reconstruction um, fairly substantially when they get into that category. Um, you know, this requires if there is a loss for materials to be custom made, which increases the amount of re replacement cost for the entire structure, which, which plays into that. So another thing to look out for in vintage homes um, asbestos, lead paint, you know, lead pipes, um, unique building materials, but then also um, knob and tube wiring. Knob and tube wiring is a huge fire risk. It is not acceptable by really the majority of insurance carriers unless you get to the surplus lines or non-admitted markets. So something to look out for there. Um, because we're, we're, kind of, we're kind of fortunate to be in the home uh, you know, market that we're in because these homes have been flipped so many times that most likely these elements have been updated, but, you know, always a good thing to, to double check on. So miscellaneous conditions, um, you know, there are a few mis miscellaneous conditions of a home that come up from time to time. Um, you know, if you have questions of these, let me know, you know, um, you know, certain stucco problems with materials that, that they used to make stucco out of. Um, you know, formaldehyde. I know that we had that huge uh, home builder in Colorado a few years back who, you know, they found out that the joists of their floors or something had formaldehyde in them and that it was causing environmental and safety um, health problems for, for consumers. And, um, you know, th those are, you know, we put a stop notice or a, a non-bind notice on all homes of that uh, standard because, um, you know, we, we didn't want to get into that type of risk. So again, so many unforetold told things that could, could occur um, uh, th that you maybe want to look out for. So bingo. I'll just make a note. Um, I, I, um, I used to, I used to work at a plumbing supply house and um, that those polybutylene pipes, they're usually gray. If you go into a home and you see gray water lines, um, you're going to want to probably snap some pictures, send it to your inspector. Um, that is something that it, it, that whole house needs redone. I, I, I've never seen gray water lines that didn't come out to be poly, uh, polybutylene, unless you're in a mobile home. There are some out there that are still standard, but um, those gray pipes in a residential home, you either need to run or let your clients know that's about a $12,000 replumbing job. Yep. Yep. And, you know, back in the day with the service lines, they used to use uh, clay and cast iron and man, that they found out a couple of decades later when it was too late, that was not a good material <laughs> and, <Horrible>. and <laughs> uh, humans, right? Trial and error. I mean, that's how we find out what's better is by trial and error. Unfortunately, some of those are still in that category. So, um, so, you know, breed of dogs, another reason, you know, if one of your clients, uh, you know, ha has an aggressive dog, um, regardless of breed, if it's aggressive, it's, if it's bit anyone, if the insurance inspector goes out to the house and that dog is just snarling and, you know, foaming at the mouth and clawing its way to try to get to whoever's at the fence, it's probably not going to be something that an insurance company wants to take the risk of. There are companies that don't mind aggressive breeds of dog. This is a huge um, point of contention for me personally, because, um, you know, I have an aggressive breed of dog, um, you know, uh, well, the one that is typically thought of a little bit more aggressive than maybe like a Chihuahua, but I have a Siberian Husky, I have two Siberian Huskies, for some reason, they're not on the list, even though Siberians have known to, to cause losses to other animals and, and other people as well. And um, there's a lot of dogs that get bad raps, I don't necessarily agree with it. Um, you know, we are trying to change that perception in the insurance industry, um, but, you know, there are, are ways to get exceptions for this, but unfortunately, some of these breeds of dogs fall into the statistics of possibly bad dog owners or 
you know, uh, certain situations in that regard, there are dog breeds that are, that may be uh, non-insurable. These dog breeds may prove difficulty in, in insuring. An exception code may be available. However, some insurance companies may choose not to insure the dog if aggressive or has previously bit another dog or person, regardless of the breed. So this is another reason why having ample time to review your buyer's insurance is, is crucial. Um, situation, um, you know, ultimately, uh, we had a client had a, uh, uh, a dog, an Australian shepherd, uh, broke out and um, tried to play with a teacup Yorkie across the street. Just play. Wasn't being vicious. Ended up breaking that teacup Yorkie's leg. And that teacup Yorkie was a like world renowned show dog. And the suit on that was like, you know, $25,000. The insured got a ticket and had to take classes for his Australian Shepherd. So, you know, any dog, any breed of dog can do this. You want to have it listed on the policy so that you have additional liability exposure. Again, anything that you own, anything that's a dependent of yours, anything that you take care of, including children, are your responsibility and you can be found liable for um, acts that they commit. Um, sometimes is, is insured under homeowners. As, a, as a, just a quick story, there was a um, homeowner's loss that paid out uh, two middle age, two middle school age kids throwing a giant large metal trash can lid as a frisbee right that's what kids do they 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 do stuff like that and um there was a, a another young kid that walked out of the door and right as the frisbee was coming in hit hit that that person right in the bridge of the nose um you know broke the nose and fractured it um and it ap actually happened at a at a school here in in longmont but um uh, ultimately, that was that was something that the homeowner's liability coverage paid for for the parents of the kids who were throwing the metal trash can lid. Um, that was a that was a loss. You know that that student that got injured suffered humiliation. Um, you know, lost school, um, friendship issues. You know, I mean, kids are kids are not nice in, in some of those situations. So, um, I will say that insurance companies are starting to let up a little bit on this breed of dog um, issue. Um, I have gotten approvals for pit bulls with our company recently, um, you know, depending on the situation, depending on the age of the pit bull, the temperament, usually I have to take a picture of the pit bull meeting it, uh, you know, rolling over with me scratching its belly is sometimes, you know, a, a requirement to show that it's a, a fairly calm, calm dog. So um, it, it is possible. You just want to make, make sure that you bring that up before it becomes an issue before you're having to scramble and, and, and make things happen. So. That's awesome. Um, so let's talk about insurance score or risk-based score. This is probably <laughs> this is probably the largest point of contention for insurance agents in the state of Colorado. But um, an insurance-based risk score can be derived from a clue report, as well as other sources. The risk score is a number that is attributed to each individual. The risk score is a complicated calculation that is a combination of credit score, loss history, socioeconomic status, occupation, criminal record, location of the home, and more. This score is arranged from you know 500 to 800, similar to an actual credit score, but with many more variables, um, including credit score criteria. Um, the higher the score, the more insurance companies will be willing to provide insurance, as well as uh, provide better premiums. So an exceptional risk score can allow for insurance companies like mine to reward handsomely with amazingly low premiums, as well as consider additional risks. So if there were multiple claims, but this person has an exceedingly high risk score, there is room for exceptions more for those types of individuals. So because risk scores account for many more variables than credit scores do, sometimes people have an amazing credit score, but less than desirable loss history. Um, thus preventing insurability or having higher than expected premiums. So even though your credit score is good, your risk score can, can still not be very good and prevent insurability. Um, it is a good idea to inform your clients that they should expect to pay more depending on their risk scores. Sometimes if the insurance is too high in premium, the loan process will fall through. I think you always have that neighbor or that friend and you're like, how much do you pay for insurance? And then you guys compare just off price, but there's so many, 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 many other variables that go into the cost of insurance for each individual person that just merely talking about price is just not an effective way of, of, of looking at that. So um, criminal record may affect insurability because insurance is a financial product that affords financial uh, protection. Criminal records can prevent qualification for certain carriers. The type of carrier that will write this risk um, is typically on a surplus or non-admitted insurance carrier lines. Um, certain insurance agents like myself have access to the surplus lines market uh, for personal homeowners policies. A non-admitted insurance carrier is one that is not regulated by the state 
and does not contribute to the state guarantee fund. The state guarantee fund protects policyholders from the bankruptcy or insolvency of insurance carriers, providing the coverage to the insured. So an example of this is a carrier. So an example of a surplus lines carrier is Lloyd's of London. I'm not sure if you anyone's heard of Lloyd's of London. They are actually the oldest insurance company in existence. They were established in like, I think the 17th century or or something like that. I mean, they are they're huge. They they are based out of um, out of Britain. Um, you might may have heard of them. They insure some some pretty high risk celebrities and and things of that nature. So um, there are instances uh, uh, where many smaller uh, charges uh, may prevent insurance qualification as well. Felonies are really the largest um, disqualification in insurance policies on the standard line market. Um, some some companies don't care about felonies if they've been after a certain period of time. So again, something to look out for um, when talking with your insureds. So newly immigrated to the United States. So people that have been newly immigrated that are trying to purchase a house and, and get funding for um, you know, when, when someone newly immigrates to the United States, regardless of their affluence or economic status, it will be difficult to place insurance with an admitted carrier. Um, if the spouse is a U.S. citizen, there is a possibility in providing coverage. Um, but because this person isn't from America, they don't have a risk score. They don't have a way for insurance companies to determine their propensity for loss or, or track their record or come up with a score. Also, if they don't have a social security number, that's also a, a kind of a, a dead end in that regard. So there are carriers that don't necessarily care about that. They can take green cards, they can take you know, um, you know, visas and, and other forms of identification and, and providing insurance, but um, just something else to look out for as well. So we did touch on the, the wildfire risk score earlier. Um, brush fire scores are a standard that every insurance quote or proposal, every home has a score that is unique to its surrounding and geographical location. If a home is in the mountains, then the fire risk will be high and we'll have difficulty insuring. And, and most likely, um, you know, we insure all of our mountain properties with Lloyd's of London. And um, I'm actually going through quite a few claims um, due to the fires that broke out last year. And uh, they are, uh, they're actually really great to work with. I was surprised, um, never had to file a claim with them before, um, but um, I was actually very surprised at how how nice the, the process has been. So that's been my experience thus far. And uh, I find that they're really taking care of my clients. So even though it's a non-admitted carrier with a reputation like, like, like Lloyds of London has, um, that can make you feel safer, um, you know, with your clients having a home policy like that. Again, if the lender will allow it. So that's about everything that we have here today. Um, are there any questions or concerns or feedback that, um, that anyone would like to provide from this presentation? Bueller? I I've done asked all mine. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> so- I don't have a question, but I didn't realize that dog breeds had anything to do with insurance. I've never come across that. So that was really interesting. It can, you know, every carrier is a little bit different, Melissa. So um, it really comes down to what carrier they have, what their standards are, if that dog has ever had an aggressive history, um, things of that nature. Um, so this is something that um, I created and I can send this out to Bruce and, and he can distribute it to you guys. Um, this is an automatic insurance qualification system worksheet. And what this does is, is it basically just allows you to go through, if you can implement this into your initial fact finding with your clients, you can understand how likely they are to be approved with an insurance company or how likely they are to get an insurance policy when it comes time to put that in place. So ultimately, um, you know, because the insurance follows the individuals and the home, we have, we have criteria for both here. And so if um, the majority of the answers fall in the one category, the possibility for in insurability is highest. The majority of answers in the three category indicates your clients may have difficulty in qualifying for homeowner's insurance. Additional fact finding is needing if any answers fall in the two category. So two is kind of like a misnomer, we, we're not sure, but um, if, if most things are not apparent or evident, um, 
you know, most likely your client's going to be able to get approved for a homeowner's policy. Right on. So it, yeah, send it, that out and we'll get it on uh, the PC Facebook page uh, file. Okay. And then, um, you know, if, if it falls under three, um, it doesn't mean that they necessarily can't qualify for insurance. It just most likely means that they won't be able to qualify for standard lines insurance. And you're most likely going to have to take that to the surplus lines market. Um, I also have a little questionnaire here um, for people. And this is something that I just like to, you know, uh, get back from the audience. So Bruce, I'll send this out too. If anyone wants to fill this out, send this back to me. I'd love to hear your feedback just so that I can improve upon this in the future and uh, make sure that I'm providing more value. If there's things that maybe I didn't have in here, things I could have done differently, um, please let me know. This is the first time I've ever done this on Zoom. Usually I'm like in front of a class teaching it. So um, let, you know, feel free to create, uh, critique, you know, kind of what that experience looks like. Um, I do have one other thing here and it is this document. Um, and this is the little pre-checklist, post-checklist that I came up with, uh, preventing client disappointments, uh, for real estate agents due to roof and insurance issues. So we kind of briefly talked about this before, um, we got on with our meeting. Um, but you really want to, you know, ultimately it's, it's one thing to put a policy in force to accommodate a, a client's monthly budget to qualify for the loan, but that coverage may cause them further financial, uh, stress later down the road, depending on what happens. So, um, I'll get this sent out to you if it can be of, uh, of use to you, um, you know, that, that'd be phenomenal. So. If you want to send that to me, Sean, I'd be more than willing to send it to everybody. So. Okay. Um, yeah, or Bruce and Bruce can send it to me either way. Hey, Davis, put your email in there for him, please. I am right now. That's awesome. I have, I have one more question. Um, yeah. On the MLS, sometimes it will say that generally I see it with condos that they're uninsurable. Is that just because they have used too many insurance claims like you were talking about? Or um, is there another reason that a condo or a home would be uninsurable and that they would put that in the MLS? Now, are you speaking about any home or, ju or just condos? I've only seen it with condos, um, but I'm not sure if it's condo specific. Um, so, you know, it, it could be a number of different reasons why it's uninsurable. Um, it's very interesting to put that on an MLS. Hey, hey by the way, you need cash for this purchase because um, it's uninsurable. Um, I, I'd have to have probably more context to that to, to fully understand. Um, you know, the reasons why that, that, that may exist, but condos require I, an SH. Oh, go ahead. No, please go ahead. Um, condos require an SH six form. Um, and that's for a, an attached dwelling where we're covering just the interior of the structure. So the exterior of the structure is going to have, um, you know, the master HOA policy typically is going to cover that. Um, you know, I, I, you know, unless there's been, you know, substantial claims or, or there's, you know, something going on in that condominium complex where um, an insurance wouldn't, wouldn't pick it up. Um, you know, if you come into that situation, feel free to send that over to me and I'd be more than happy to take a look at it. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. I think I can shed some light on it because I've seen that type of wording. Um, and that what, what that is, is FHA and VA insurability. So FA, it, most likely, if, if you ever see that example, Melissa, send it to me. Okay. Um, I'm going to 100% guess that it's an FHA VA assurability thing. Um, if the condominium association does not file um, this application every single year with FHA and VA, um, their eligibility is, is it, 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 you can't get a loan through that. And they call it insurability uh, because it's insurability on, on the loans and not necessarily the dwelling. So that's what my guess is. Okay. Yeah, I'll and, send you one know, if I find one. That actually hit, hit struck a bell with me. I, I actually had a conversation with someone that they didn't qualify for FHA or, or, you know, the other loan program that you indicated, Bruce, because the HOA didn't have enough funds yep. in their general funds to, to say, Hey, I have enough I have enough funding to cover small losses or improvements um, accordingly. So that that's a un, that's an underwriting criteria for for a lender, right? I mean, yep. So much. Yep. So um, well, it's been a pleasure to.
to be with you guys here today. Um, I hope that this has been valuable. Um, I do also have, um, you know, something else I'll send out to Bruce. It's a video. We do uh, strive to provide more value to real estate agents as well. And, um, you know, sometimes insurance agents are in the uh, position to reciprocate business to, to real estate agents. And as a result, um, we, uh, we, we have a marketing and advertising si uh, system as well. So um, if you ever want more information on that, um, definitely let me know. I'll send that out to Bruce. It's a quick six minute video. Um, if you have any questions, let me know. But um, it was a pleasure to be with you guys here today, Bruce. Thank you so much for, for letting me uh, Thanks, come and provide you. this. You're, you're very welcome. Thank Absolutely. you. You bet. You bet. Thank you. Hey, CC came on all those uh, attachments and whatnot too. You're okay. Absolutely. Cool. Thanks guys. I'll awesome. end the recording now. Get out there and, and make stuff happen. Yes, sir. <laughs> All right. Bye now.